We're rolling. We're rolling again. Season 2, episode 3. Is it? Wow, how time passes. Indeed. It's the uh, end of week 2 and we're already on to episode 3. Yeah, we're well, doing well. You're always ahead of the game. Ahead of the curve. <laughs> and, uh, well, should we just say welcome to the Impact Narrative? We and, should uh, say welcome to the Impact Narrative. Our regular, if not weekly, prattle about things going on in the world, most of which are extremely gloomy, but we, you know, obviously try to show uh, that uh, we can, at the end of it, still look reasonably uh, content, despite all the terrible things going on in the uh, world. We do our best to go behind the news, Mark, to, mm. to get at what's really happening, to contest a lot of the, a lot of the narratives that are out there in world politics. But before mm. we start, I have to ask you something. Okay. This is something that I've just picked up on. Ah. And it's, it's somewhat personal, but it's also okay. incredibly intriguing. Right. You're obviously, unlike myself, a man who shaves on a regular basis. Uh, well, yeah, but not in a particularly rigorous way. More sort of introducing a razor vaguely to the facial... Indeed. Just out of interest, are you a wet shave or are you a le an electronic razor? Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a uh, wet shave to the extent that I splash my face and then go... and then right, okay. grimace. Oh, you're, you're doing well not to have... Um... I've over the years developed a right. technique which allows me, but of course that technique means that I leave most of the stubble in place. Excellent. Well, the reason for me asking this is that there is one rogue hair right. that isn't so much in the sort of Charlie Chaplin-esque place, but it's just beneath your ear. Okay. And it's, it's probably growing out of my ears. Well, it's certainly not. It's certainly growing out of your chin, where one has shaved. But right. what's really Should interesting is that uh, it's about an inch and a half long, <laughs> <laughs> which suggests to me that it's, no, uh, it's uh, that's a my... spot that you have routinely missed. Yeah. Well, there are but, um, bits which are very yeah. Uh, it, it just, good. No, no, no was, thank uh, you. As thank, I was looking you, at you, Mark, it was just drawn to. I'll make it a matter of urgency no. that I uh, cultivate it so that it's uh, an inch and three quarters long. Excellent, we can measure so, it to the end of the season. Uh, uh, having That's the fashion or you know whatever, grooming section of the show, which Indeed. is a regular Indeed. feature. That's about as light as this show is going to get, I think. Yes, so are you going to start with the, um, the uh, position in Saudi Arabia? Is that what you want to well, delve that's, into? That's what I was going to bring to the table, Mark. I think uh, we've... we've it's heard a lot of news in the past week or so about what's been happening with with the Jamal Khashoggi case. Mm. It's having some pretty serious ramifications in uh, in global politics. And today there were suggestions that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman should be forced to resign. Ah, if from one, being a Crown Prince. If one resigns from being a Crown, a crown yeah. Prince, or whether one abdicates, I don't know. If well, I think abdicates, or yes. But yeah. do you abdicate from the position of Crown yeah, Prince? Yeah, I would have thought so. If you can abdicate from being a king, you mm. can abdicate from being a deputy king. Or Right, okay. Yeah, I think abdicate the, is a word which is used in these, uh, rather than resi resign. Yeah. It's like saying, I relinquish my claim to whatever. Well, that was the suggestion with where we're at today, and I think that, that demonstrates quite how far we've come in the past in the past two weeks yeah and I mean it, this this whole crisis has has revealed a great deal about Saudi Arabia but it's also revealed a great deal about about global politics so I wonder if maybe we should start this by just taking stock of what's happened since we last spoke about this on air a week ago today yeah be my guest well I guess not very much has happened. Ah, right. Okay, next item. In that well, the, there, there hasn't been an official statement by the Saudis. They haven't. Mm. They haven't declared we are not responsible. They haven't given a statement explaining what happened. Mm. There just appears to have been a sort of a muddled few remarks leaked ahead of what I assume will be some kind of statement, either accepting responsibility or placing the blame on a rogue individual or indeed a rogue individual. 15 people who yeah. work for the Saudi government because that of course is what has come out in the past mm. week or so just quite how involved these 15 people are mm. within the, the Saudi political system we know that a number of them have got links to to Mohammed bin Salman the crown prince so we know that but <laughs> quite mm. where the order came from is obviously uh, up for grabs and to be discussed. But Turkey mm. has been pushing quite hard on this, pushing quite hard to figure out what's happening, 
what's happened, who was involved, how all of this was was undertaken. There have been some pretty gruesome stories coming out of Istanbul, coming out of Ankara, mm -hmm. of, of leaked recordings. There were suggestions that Mr Khashoggi was wearing an Apple Watch, that he would then record uh, what happened to him that was uploaded to the iCloud. Yeah. And... Um, and allegedly that recording has been obtained by Turkish authorities. Of course, this is all still to be verified. Mm. Well, but I think the, the thing that doesn't need to be verified is that this person is no longer um, publicly visible. And he was that much very much so on yeah. the day of his disappearance. So that much is true. I think it's generally accepted that Mr. Khashoggi has been killed. And that uh, events occurred in the consulate because yes. there's no evidence of him ever leaving that building. This isn't speculation. This is uh, Unless it was a very cleverly doctored piece of footage of him entering the consulate, uh, there hasn't been a cleverly doctored piece of footage of him no. leaving the consulate, and therefore one would tend to assume that this happened. I think that's that's a relatively safe bet, and we obviously don't want to engage in speculation. That is mm. something that has been pretty appalling. I think the the level of speculation from a range of different people across the world about what happened and the mm. sort of the so-called leaks from various people well connected to the Turkish authorities. I think mm. that's a, a pretty damning set of of events, particularly so for Mr. Kocuji's family and. Mm. In in lieu of, of any real formal investigation or statements to the contrary, I think yeah. it's, it's a little bit uncertain. But it appears that a 15-man squad from Saudi Arabia went into the, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and Mr. Khashoggi mm. is no more. Yeah. I think that much we can safely say. Yeah. Now... The allegations range, of course, we don't need to document all the, the extent of those allegations and the, the actual brutality of those, mm. but it looks like there are a couple of narratives that either he was intentionally killed or accidentally killed and it's in an attempt to, to extradite him out of the country. Ah. But obviously the, the exact... Yes, but in any case, I mean, from the point of view of... Uh global politics and this is what um, we're going to get to I think. any attempt to interfere with him once he'd of his own free will gone into the consulate any attempt to apprehend him and extradite him given that he's a regular columnist for the Washington yeah. Post it, it has really in a way any attempt to do any kind of violence to him has got the same implication whether it went to the yeah. extent of killing him or yeah, whether it was just true. simply apprehending him that's certainly true, and I think the interesting things, the interesting developments that have occurred since we last spoke occur in international politics. In the international community's response to, to what happened with Mr Khashoggi. And I think this is twofold. Mm, right. The first is the formal um, diplomatic responses that we've seen. We've seen a number of... of States mm. figures of of um, official diplomats pulling out of a prominent investor meeting in mm. Saudi Arabia, the so-called Davos in the desert, which yeah. I find somewhat Orientalist, mm. but uh, pulling out of that, which <laughs> displays serious concerns about about Saudi actions. Mm. But then there's also the global civil society, yeah, driven by the Washington Post. Yes, yes. Which, of course, opens another field for uh, discussion, the extent to which if uh, Mr. Khashoggi had been exactly the same person but had not written columns in the Washington Post, it may well be that the world's media might have been a little bit less interested in this story. And again, our usual theme is that this particular violation, which seems to have happened, can't really be compared in its scale to what's going on in yeah. uh, Yemen, which the world's media seems less interested in. But that's, that's certainly true. I think that's... that's that's certainly a key factor in this story. Mm. But I think it, it's interesting how initially there was a, a general outcry from, or driven by perhaps, the Washington Post and, and colleagues of Mr. Khashoggi, his friends, people who were very critical of the Saudis, but there was a general outcry at the mm. fact that this had happened to a, to a public figure, to a dissident, to an international journalist. And we've seen across recent history there's been a widespread... Um, repression and restriction of journalists mm. but then this this seems to have taken on a life of its own yeah but then we also saw yesterday 
the British um, British International Development Secretary Liam Fox pulling out of this. Well, International Trade Secretary. Sorry, yeah. International yeah. Trade Secretary. In, in a very interesting move, in a way, because mm. it's what the Dutch uh, and, the, and French, the French, and then the British, and then there's talk that the mm. US are going to. I mean, that's the point. That it would seem to me that um, it's a kind of a coordinated decision because um, and and lurking behind this, I don't know what you what would think about this, but. Um, uh, it's in the interest, this is very dark, but it's in the interest of uh, certain countries which are uh, dependent on Saudi oil for Saudi Arabia's economy not to diversify. And so, That's you know, uh, Dav mm. Davos in the desert was not necessarily uh, the most welcome thing in the world for these powers in any case, because obviously they want Saudi Arabia to be a mono economy almost, because then the relationship in terms of um, uh, oil dependency is a bit sure. less, you know, if, if the Saudis had other uh, sources of uh, prosperity, then it would become less dependent on the oil mm. connection with the, anyway, but mm. never mind. But I mean, I it seems interesting because it would seem on the, on the surface a real, almost something close to a breach of diplomatic relations if you're saying we've been invited to this conference and we're yeah. not going now that's uh, more than it's more than a boycott of the olympics for example or yeah, the world certainly. cup this is actually a, a tangible gesture well, and let's... you've got to wonder why they've decided that that tangible gesture again recalling the ambassador yeah. the, recalling the british ambassador from riyadh whatever would have been less of a gesture than not attending this very important economic meeting yeah, and I think you're right with this, that the key to this this conference next week is is an attempt to diversify the Saudi economy. It's mm. an attempt to to fulfill the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030, which is to try and move the kingdom away from its reliance on oil, yeah. to try and reform its economy, to try and bring it into, um, into line with others, mm. and, and have it driven by... Um, by not just a reliance on oil, but mm. but also modern technology, yeah. driven more by um, by financial investment, become the Dubai of the Arabian Peninsula to replace Dubai, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the flagship uh, front flagship part of this is something called Neom, which right. is a, a fascinating project based in Saudi, but with with. Um, with land and territory from Egypt and Jordan under Saudi sovereignty. Ah. Now this is a huge project, a huge um, developmental technological vision mm. that requires massive investment. Mm. It's the flagship of Mohammed bin Salman's reform agenda. Vision 2030, Neom, moving the kingdom forward. Right. And yeah, well, in that case, uh, what I was floating as a possibility becomes a little bit, but certainly more fascinating as an angle on this. It does. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go quite so far as, as the perhaps slightly conspiratorial, um, there's an attempt to maybe prevent reform and to, to keep Saudi Arabia in its oil producing box. Yeah. But you're certainly right that this is a very strong message mm. that at a time when the Saudis are trying to raise a great deal of money to bring in outside investment, yeah. that you have these prominent international figures. Mm. And let's not forget, this was driven initially, the first person to do this, I believe, was Richard Branson. Branson, of course, yeah, which is, that was a, a pretty a, a, a astonishing, mm. maybe he's a reader of the Washington Post, who well, knows? Perhaps. But that was uh, remarkable. Uh, okay, he is about to leave the planet for a, a, a journey to boldly go where no oh, right. okay. bearded entrepreneur has gone before. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's space, spa well, I think it's a few months away. Oh, right. But even so, it's a kind of gesture you might afford to make if you mm. intend to leave planet Earth for a bit. Well, perhaps, yeah. But uh, I think it's, it's a very important moment for, for the Saudi Kingdom. Mm it's called into question the very nature of Mohammed bin Salman's reform project. Mm. Now, of course, there are many in Saudi who are still incredibly supportive of Mohammed bin Salman. They sure. see him as a bulwark against more conservative forces, against a return to a, a more strict interpretation mm. of Islam that Mohammed bin Salman has been incredibly vocal against. Yeah. And so there are people who are very concerned about this, who are, who are increasingly anti 
anti-American, anti-British, anti-Western for their vocal condemnation of the killing, mm. apparently, of Mr. Khashoggi. Mm. So I think it's a, a very delicate moment. And yeah. one, um, one Saudi scholar based in the UK working with, with us here at the Richardson Institute in the CEPAD project has actually called for the removal of Mohammed bin Salman as Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. Mm. Yeah, which would, uh, would mean that um, perhaps the reforms that most Western observers think are actually mm. good <laughs> might well be in jeopardy. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Let's not forget that this is, this is not the first issue to, um, to befall the Crown Prince. There is mm. the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Yemen, which yeah, is yeah. a big source of international concern, even if it's not that noisy. Yeah. There is the, the handling of the Saad Hariri case, where um, the Lebanese Prime Minister was detained, mm. placed under house arrest Which in Riyadh. Which this programme flagged up. Oh, we did indeed. Mm. And then there was the, the botched Riyadh peace plan, where the Crown Prince put forward a deal to bring about peace between the Israelis and Palestinians, and it was a deal that was, was essentially a, a yeah. no-go area. Aye. So... It's a very precarious position that the Crown Prince finds himself in. Yeah, yeah, aye. So, yeah, well, fascinating, and watch this space. I and, think so. Uh, I think what yeah. Mr Trump does in the, in the coming days will, will really set the tone. If he comes out in support mm. of, of Saudi Arabia, well... Yeah, well, I mean, what he's done has been incredibly predictable. You could almost have scripted it, that, that he's mm. um, kind of expressed concern but has uh, left the door open for some kind of an excuse as Emerson if in fact he yeah. was hinting at excuses that could be used uh, to get the Saudis out of this um, this particular yeah. mess and so he might say you know whatever you think of this in the moral terms or whatever you could say that that is actually quite a, a quite a responsible position mm -hmm. to take given the stakes uh, of, of things being uh, people misspeaking and causing temperatures Certainly. to rise yeah. that actually was I think was uh, un usually all right <laughs> yeah I think you might be right on this one so I think the thing to wait for is is any official statement from Saudi Arabia mm. from Turkey yeah or from the United States yeah because so you got to say just the last thing the Turkish behavior you mentioned this earlier that if you have got evidence then you know you don't hint that you've got it unless you've got some agenda and you're using the idea that you've got evidence for some kind of leverage, Indeed. Um, given that it's happened, it's a kind of a, an infringement of Turkey, if you know, in, in many ways. And you would have thought that if they had evidence, they would want it to be rushed out in order to bolster their yeah. their, their case for some kind of reparations or <clears throat> certainly some some kind of uh, criminal investigation. With Saudi support, which anyway, um, that just shows the, the <coughs> complex geopolitical picture. Oh wow, absolutely, absolutely. And Mr. Erdogan and um, mm. the Americans have been talking to him, and he's uh, clearly is is going to be looking at this as some kind of way uh, of establishing. Because, uh, of course, the savage irony is the way that dissidents are treated in of course, yeah. <laughs> Turkey. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, good. Well, that's very good. Are we going uh, so to... So, moving on to something, uh, something far less complex. My, my hair. Is it? Where is it? Oh, it's on the other side, Mark. That, oh, this side? It is, yeah. Oh, that one. Oh, no, no, no. That's not the one. That's an ear one. That's a different one. Yeah, I'm going to have to get a, a, a big, uh, well, perhaps some kind of hedge trimmer. Perhaps. Perhaps. But um, something far simpler. Brexit. Yeah, good, okay. So well, we're kicking the can further down the road, are we? Yeah, we are, and uh, it, it's um, more and more. I mean, again, the, the uh, I've been looking closely at the media headlines, and it's quite interesting. I would say the balance of the Brexit papers are wanting either to keep this out of their headlines or are hinting at a much more pragmatic attitude to all this, and some have very clearly swung behind Mrs. May. I don't the, the hardline Brexiteers have got their headquarters in the Daily Telegraph, but there's even signs that the Daily Mail, one would have expected to be shrieking, is being really quite cautious about this. Uh, so, you know, again, the, I think the, um, the question uh, of uh, so the extent to which people take their, the lead from their newspapers, I think mm. Brexit uh, Lever supporters will be perhaps a little bit confused because this is the time when a lot of the hardline levers 
will be hoping for very impassioned headlines because whatever one th thinks of the ultimate outcome this delay after delay after delay is all the time making referendum results look doubtful because it was so much based on the idea that things could be done quickly and cleanly uh, you know, the more that Mrs May delays whatever her motives, to do, well we know she's got mixed motives to doing yeah. it but it, it, it actually in my view damages the the case that was presented to the public in 2016 uh, and how long will the Tory backbenchers keep patience with her um, the, the, but again you know all these things the, the complexity of these um, incidents even on the domestic level so many different factors at play and the fact that the Brexiteers do not have an obvious successor yeah. to Mrs May I think if there had been somebody with an unblotted copybook then that person would already be uh, is there not moving is there in. not uh, Mr Rhys Mogg uh, but his he's well his copybook is um, has got kind of property of Eton School on the um, or Eton College rather mm. on it that's the that's a bit otherwise yeah you would have thought you know he he would have had a, he's a not much the, stronger support. He's not the populist no. man of the people. Uh, well, he is, but he is. He's great on Question Time. Very eloquent. Very, True. you know. Uh, you could say that he is. The, the, he actually says things which are witty rather than things which are, you know, the kind of thing that Johnson comes up with. He is a, you know, a far more interesting person than his opponents might think. However, he's yeah. completely inappropriate as Prime Minister or even as leader of the Tory Party unless it wants to go into some self-indulgent exile for a little while and um, yeah I mean all sorts of things the uncertainty about whether uh, there's obviously a march tomorrow uh, in support of a second referendum mm -hmm. chances of that I think are vanishingly small what percentage but do you think oh, are the oh, chances of second yeah. referendum not point not not what not right, not, okay. not, 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 not one certainly now you know in yeah. in the immediate uh, future but the chances of a general election I think have marginally increased uh, simply because again you know uh, and, and this is being almost hinted at by people like Mr Corbyn because mm. he's saying that Labour policy um, is about the only thing that's got a majority in the House of Commons yeah. that you know staying in a, cust a customs union and the single market might just about get through the House of Commons, whereas Mrs May's deal won't, uh, no deal won't, yeah. um, or at least under normal circumstances wouldn't. And so, the, I mean, basically the, the picture there being presented, because the House of Commons hasn't really been a, a, asked to give a verdict on much yet, apart from paving legislation, uh, that you've got a dysfunctional mm -hmm. Parliament. And the answer to a dysfunctional Parliament is a general election. I think you're right. So we could see that before we are due to leave. Um, well, there are either two possibilities: you're going to have a general election in the relatively near future, yeah. or it's going to hang on till 2022. Because that is, I think I've said on this program, Mrs. May's uh, strategy was to hang on till 2022, yeah. and um, you know she's really um, hoping that she can get away with that delay um, and it could be that in many I mean the EU obviously wants delay as well the longer Britain stays in in this transitional period the more the chances are that the transition will last for our lifetimes yeah yeah that's that's certainly true but you raised an interesting point and that was about legislation mm. but we've not really engaged with the the sheer volume of, of things that require legislation if if, mm. if brexit is to take place this, this oh well, but yeah, but all that's happened is that EU law has very often just been translated into British law. All that kind of thing mm. has happened. But that is a, a very long process, given the amount of legislation that is required. Parliament can do things. For, well, well, it depends on whether they're rebellions and amendments and all this kind of thing. But you know that process is now done, basically. But what isn't done is Parliament passing judgment on the shape of the future trading mm. uh, relationship and that's where all kinds of problems are, uh, are likely to to start right. but the other thing that's happening of course is that domestic policy is almost being we've got, I mean, we've got a budget in the next few weeks and people are now saying there's a chance that Tory backbenchers will make some kind of demonstration against the budget which is which is really a kind of vote of no confidence type uh, scenario um, but also in the things, Chancellor or in the government 
Oh well, oh, well, well in so far as the Chancellor needs the yeah. kind of approval of, of the course. Prime Minister, although their relationship has often been very rocky, but even so, uh, they'll be coordinated like hand in glove on, on the budget. Uh, and um, uh, things like universal credit, and a policy disaster on the domestic front unfolding while a policy d d d d yeah. disaster on the, uh, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of our relations with other, other countries. Um, and it just seems, as I say, the House of Commons is pretty, pretty well in, uh, you know, paralysed because of the divisions and the risks of backbench rebellions and DUP rebellions. And, you know, it, it, it is the kind of thing that ought to be uh, remedied by a general election. Yeah. But, you know, obviously Mrs May's agenda does not include an immediate general election. Indeed. Anyway, there we wow. go. Well, book of the week. Nice cheery stuff. So, Mark, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. We so are. Book of the week. Book of the week. What is this book of the week? It's called The Count of Monte ah, Cristo by excellent. Alexandre Dumas. And, just very quickly, just think... Dumas. Well, Dumas, no, as, no. Um, as someone once famously said in he, The Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, well, the Shawshank Redemption is, of course, stolen from course. Uh, this, which is very, very interesting indeed. Um, but uh, the, what's he called? The guy with the treasure says... Uh, um, it, it, uh, no he, spoilers. You know as well as I do, my dear boy, that in politics there are no people, only ideas, no feelings, only interests. And uh, that, in that sentence, um, you know, there's quite a few famous political mm. scientists, have, scientists have made their reputation for saying very similar Indeed. things. But and a truly wonderful book, Mark, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you're reading some fiction. Yeah, but of course it's, you know, it's proper historical fiction in a way, because it's so much at a distance that yeah. uh, you know, Napoleon doesn't even get apart, but they're obviously, you know, uh, you've got to know a bit about the history of the period, but yeah, True. rollicking read. Now, have you read Don Quixote properly? No. Ah, well, you see, that's what you should do, because that's absolutely it's wonderful. True. Have you read, you re must have read War and Peace. Of course. Yeah. The right, other oh, chunky version. books. Oh, the abridged no, 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 version. I just, I just. Yeah, have you got a book of the week? No. Right. No, this has been a writing week rather than a uh, reading week. Mm. Oh, and incidentally, yes, finally, my previous uh, book of the week, which I didn't really say the title, Ghost Wars, well, oh, uh, yes. um, if you read that, then the stuff that's been going on in Turkey, the Saudi Arabia thing, isn't anything like so surprising because, you know, the, the, the Saudi intelligence services were clearly regarded by their supposed allies as being a law unto themselves that nobody could... So the, the Pakistani uh, intelligence service was kind of... Um, half working and autonomously of any rules or regulation, but the Saudi one seemed to be the giving almost leave for other intelligence services to behave with no regard to international law, with of course the, the tacit permission of the United States. Indeed. Well, interesting, and it's, it's good that, that a previous book of the week is getting another mention. Exactly. Mark, before we go, there are two things. One, on last week's show, we talked about Ms. Taylor Swift. Oh, yes! Right. And I would just like to get your reaction to a little snippet of... Yeah, but... Hey, man! Groovy! Aren't you going to show this to the... Is this not breaking copyright? It's not if we keep it to less than 20 seconds. Right. Well, I've heard enough. It's absolute rubbish. Excellent. I've never heard anything more. Well, I have, actually. Of course you have. But it is toe-tappingly irritating. Well, that was 15 seconds of, of that Taylor I'll never Swift get back again. That you'll never get back again, but I thoroughly oh, enjoyed your reaction. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Well, it just danced while the music still goes on by ABBA. It's, uh, you know, uh, a world week, apart we from will, that. Uh, we will discover... It's Theresa May's favourite song. Probably isn't that. It's probably Money, Money, Money or <laughs> Backbench Rebellion, Backbench Rebellion, Backbench Rebellion. The other exciting news is that we are now listed on oh. Spotify. Yeah, but isn't and that... iTunes. I was thinking, I've heard of this Spotify. Isn't it a curse in Harry Potter? Spotify! Isn't it? That's the tumbleweed going through. No, yes. That's what I think of when I hear the right, word Spotify. Okay. Anyway, good. Well, well all yes, our watchers, listeners on, listen Spotify. on Spotify, as well as watching on, on YouTube and 
and whatnot. They could so, do every single outlet, couldn't they? They could indeed um, hop from Spotify to YouTube to iTunes to uh, I don't know. It's a uh, it's a world of opportunity for listening to this program. Carry on. This is quite exciting. You exploring the zeitgeist. Well, no, I'm talking about other people doing it right. for me. I'm trying to forget what I've just seen on that computer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, in good. which case, let's... Is that Spotify let's... or YouTube? Or that anything. Was, that was YouTube. Ah. Mark. So on that note, let's, let's wrap it up and say you can do all the usual things like subscribe, follow, tweet, all of those things. Hmm. Um, tweet it out. That's what people are now saying, isn't it? Why, why don't you just say tweet it? Just shake it off. Is that what they're saying? That's what... Shake, yeah. sh shake it off. Isn't he a, a kind of leading political figure in Saudi Arabia? Taxi, taxi for Garnet. Mm. Anyway, yes. yes well, thank without you for further watching, ado, yeah, thank you for listening. Excellent. And, and let's uh, hope nobody's Spotify by next week, because there is a counter curse, which is uh, unspotify armus. Thanks for listening.